Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this person? You first, first, first. How would you tell this Well, here's the question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur, and today I'm looking at a talk given by Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute. The Discovery Institute is not explicitly a young earth organization, although they do have some young earthers there. Instead, it presents itself as a non-religious organization simply challenging the status quo in science, but that is simply a lie. Because if there's one thing creationists with PhDs are known for, it's lying. So let's read some excerpts from a little work prepared by Meyer himself in 1998 for internal consumption at the DI that was leaked and disowned in 1999, but since then the DI has in fact acknowledged. Their current stance is, quote, so what? It doesn't matter if we lie about our aims publicly. Here are some select bits. The proposition that human beings are created in the image of God is one of the bedrock principles on which Western civilization was built. Its influence can be detected in most, if not all, of the West's greatest achievements, including representative democracy, human rights, free enterprise, and progress in the arts and sciences. Even if true, that doesn't really tell us anything about what science should be doing. Plus, it's an odd way to start out an internal document on a non-religious organization. Phase 3 of Meyer's plan is described thusly. Once our research and writing have had time to mature, the public prepared for the reception of design theory, we will move toward a direct confrontation with the advocates of materialist science through challenge conferences in significant academic writings. We will pursue possible legal assistance in response to resistance to the integration of design theory in public school science curricula. The attention, publicity, and influence of design theory should draw scientists materialists into open debate with design theorists, and we will be ready. With an added emphasis to social sciences and humanities, we will begin to address the specific social consequences of materialism and Darwinist theory that supports it in the sciences. And his governing goals are given in two bullet points, the first being, quote, to defeat scientific materialism and its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies, and two is to replace materialistic explanations with their theistic understanding that nature and human beings are created by God. Clearly, the Discovery Institute has no ulterior religious motive. They're just here for science. Yep, indeedly doodly. And here's the thing. I don't actually have a problem with people wanting society to more closely adhere to their ideas. I think we would all like to live in a society that largely agrees with our philosophical and moral ideals. But I do have a problem when people are dishonest about it. Now, that's not to say that I might not have a problem with the ideals and philosophy of honest people. I often do. But that's a somewhat separate issue. Well, now that we know who we're dealing with, let's hear what the good doctor has to say. Although we're cutting out almost 13 minutes of irrelevant anecdotes, invocation, and introductions. I've already given Meyer the introduction he deserves. Anyway, uh, so the, the book Darwin's Doubt tells the story, and it tells the story of a doubt that Darwin had about his own theory, and how that doubt has grown up to create a major crisis in evolutionary biology today. It manifestly has not. There is no current crisis in evolutionary biology. There are ideas on the fringes, and there are open questions, but there is no more crisis in evolutionary biology than there is a crisis in chemistry. This is something I recommend reading Todd Wood on. On September 30th, 2009, he wrote a short blog post. While he did then go give an update to it to answer common questions, I'll leave it to you to read that part. It's linked in the description. What I think bears quoting in full is the three short paragraphs that make up the body of this post, and I will do so. Again, these are the words of Todd Wood, a young earth creationist. Evolution is not a theory in crisis. It is not teetering on the verge of collapse. It has not failed as a scientific explanation. There is evidence for evolution, gobs and gobs of it. It is not just speculation or a faith choice or an assumption or a religion. It is a productive framework for lots of biological research, and it has amazing explanatory power. There is no conspiracy to hide the truth about the failure of evolution. There really has been no failure of evolution as a scientific theory. It works, and it works well. I say these things not because I'm crazy, or because I've converted to evolution. I say these things because they are true. I'm motivated this morning by reading yet another clueless, well-meaning person pompously declare that evolution is a failure. People who say that are either unacquainted with the inner workings of science, or unacquainted with the evidence of evolution. Technically, they could also be deluded or lying, but that seems rather uncharitable to say. Oops. Side note from Dapper Dino. Uh, I don't think it's all that uncharitable given some of the people that, you know, advocate for young earth creationism or anti-evolutionism more broadly. But anyway, let's continue with the quotation. 
Creationist students, listen to me carefully. There is evidence for evolution. And evolution is an extremely successful scientific theory that doesn't make it ultimately true, and it doesn't mean that there could not possibly be viable alternatives. It is my own faith choice to reject evolution because I believe the Bible reveals true information about the history of the earth that is fundamentally incompatible with evolution. I am motivated to understand God's creation from what I believe to be a biblical creationist perspective. Evolution itself is not flawed or without evidence. Please don't be duped into thinking that somehow evolution itself is a failure. Please don't idolize your own ability to reason. Faith is enough. If God said it, that should settle it. Maybe that's not enough for your scoffing professor or your non-Christian friends, but it should be enough for you. Well, obviously Dr. Wood and I disagree on the ultimate conclusion, we do not disagree about the state of evolution in the scientific world. That's what the book is about. And I start the book with a line, and I'm going to quote myself. It's a little bit self-aggrandizing, but forgive me. When Charles Darwin finished his great masterpiece, The Origin of Species, he thought he had explained every clue but one. That's not even close to true. There was a lot that Darwin knew he had not explained. He didn't even know how inheritance worked, although he did have his guess, one that was ultimately shown to be wrong. The one clue he knew he hadn't explained was an event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion. That is indeed one of the things Darwin did not adequately explain. And the Cambrian Explosion refers to the geologically sudden appearance of most of the major animal groups or body plans. Yep. Brief in geological terms. Of course, geology represents such a long time that it is an actual running joke with some of my friends that basically any process that is relevant to our lives occurs in the blink of an eye, geologically speaking. The Cambrian period is a period of about 56 million years. A lot of evolution can happen in 56 million years. And in the way that biologists classify animals, uh, they have a hierarchy of classification. And the biggest group, the phyla, correspond to animal, many different types of animals that exemplify the same body plan, where a body plan is kind of an architecture. It's a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. Yeah, that was how it was explained. You know, before we really get a grasp on all the organisms in and before the Cambrian. Now, of course, we have higher classifications that show that even phyla are just variations on a theme. For example, arthropoda is a phylum, but there are stem arthropods and panarthropods that show that this segmentation and even the genetic basis for it is shared across a wider range of life outside of the phylum. Some prominent examples from the Cambrian world would include Opabidia and Anomalocaris for stem arthropods, and for panarthropods we have animals like Hallucigenia, which is related to the modern velvet worm, and even further afield we have tardigrades. All of these share a common body plan of segmentation with similar organs and similar arrangements in each segment. Similarly, with the chordates, we have hemichordates and urochordates, such as acorn worms and tunicates, that show what might be called the same basic body plan, even as we get outside of true chordata. But going even higher up than that, we have the basic triploblastic formula, where many bilaterians form three germ layers, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. All your organs trace back to one of these three layers, and which layers is highly conserved across various taxa. But beyond this, the cnidarians and tenophores share two of the three germ layers. So maybe there are really only two body plants in animals, the germ layer plan of eumetazoans and the basically no plan of porphyrins. But of course, at that point, we've gone to way higher classification levels than phyla, and this is ultimately because all of the Linnaean ranks, phylum included, are arbitrary. They are real clades in most cases, but putting a clade in a rank means nothing. There is no objective reason to say that arthropoda and not panarthropoda, or even protostomia, are phyla. Meyer is inappropriately assuming that human conventions are objective parts of reality when we know for a fact that they are not. So some familiar examples might be uh, chordates, which have an internal spinal column or uh, notochord. What about tunicates, which have a notochord as a larva? The larval tunicate could be said to share a body plan with true chordates, but they're in the phylum tunicata anyway, because it's arbitrary. Uh, and the body logic is built around an internal structure. Okay, Steve, you find me the animal with only external structure. I'll wait. Another common, uh, another distinct body plan would be things like arthropods. Hey, that was one of my examples of a group where it actually is really hard to define what we mean by a body plan once we take into account the full modern and ancient diversity of the wider group. 
Panarthropoda. And we've got lots of them running around, insects, crabs, and in ancient times we had these things that fascinated me called trilobites, and they have a hard exoskeleton. Ah, but there are paranarthropods that also had an exoskeleton, like anomalocarans. And they aren't arthropods because they lack the thing arthropods are named for, that is, jointed legs. But still, they were segmented protostomes with an exoskeleton. Why do they not count as having the same body plan? Well, because humans arbitrarily say so. You see, this argument is no more coherent than Ken Ham saying that the kind is at the family level, just because he thinks that makes the arc story seem less absurd when you take it as literal history. So it's a completely different architecture and logic built around a hard external skeleton. Okay, but what about onychophorans and tardigrades, which still share the basic arrangement of limbs, segments, and organs as arthropods, but have no exoskeleton at all? They even share the cuticle that grows a protective layer that must be periodically shed. And hey, that cuticle is shared by an even wider group of protostomes, the ectisozoans, which include panarthropods, but also penis worms, horsehair worms, and nematodes, and coincidentally, are one of Jackson Wheat's favorite groups of animals. Why isn't that cuticle shedding protostome group the basic body plan? They all share even more fundamental aspects across the group than just arthropods do with each other. Right, because this is still arbitrary nonsense. Meyer is clearly just cherry-picking data to make it seem like God created at the phylum level, even though higher levels just as clearly show common ancestry at levels above phylum. And many of the major body plans the, uh, that have ever existed on Earth emerged very suddenly and abruptly in the fossil record in the same period known as the Cambrian period. Did they, though? Because we have Precambrian Cnidarians and probable Precambrian stem arthropods and stem mollusks, and we have stem echinoderms in the Cambrian that don't even get to be real echinoderms for a while after. What's really going on is that we have an increase in hard body parts in the Cambrian which makes it easier for fossils to form. So we have more Cambrian fossils than Precambrian fossils. But what Precambrian fauna we do have shows signs of being evolutionary antecedents of the Cambrian fauna. And no, of course, we don't have candidate ancestors for all phyla in the Precambrian, but we also don't really expect to for all of them. And Darwin was aware of this in 1859, and it troubled him because it didn't, the pattern of appearance didn't really match what he had described in his book, or he had, he had depicted the history of life as a great branching tree, and yet the fossil evidence seemed to suggest that the first animals arose very abruptly with no discernible ancestors in the lower strata that would allow the scientists to connect the dots and form a tree-like picture of the history of life. There are a few things to remember. First, Darwin was writing at the end of the 19th century, about 150 years ago. Much less of the Earth had been explored for fossils, and we were much worse at finding them and much worse at studying them at the time. That's not Darwin's fault or the fault of his contemporaries. Science builds upon itself. But pointing out missing evidence, not really problems, mind you, simply then unavailable evidence from 150 years ago isn't pointing out any kind of problem for modern science. You could just as well say that when Einstein proposed relativity, he didn't have any measurements of gravitational lensing. This is true, but it wasn't a problem, and when people did measure it, they confirmed the theory. This is essentially the state of evolution. There was missing evidence in Darwin's day, and now much of it has been found. Of course, there's always more that could be found, but that's just to say that biology has open questions, like all fields of science. So this is a, uh, a, a diagram. Uh oh, how far have I gotten? I'm pressing buttons up here and not, sorry. We have an interesting system. My computer isn't hooked up to what's actually going on back there, so sorry about this. Um, here's a nice picture, by the way, that depicts the, 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 the challenge of the Cambrian explosion. You see all these different animal forms behind me. On one side, you see the sedimentary rock column, and on the other side, you see the standard uh, geological dating scheme in millions of years. I was under the impression that Meyer was an old earther and generally accepted science about the age of the earth, so it's a bit odd to see him calling the consensus ages quote-unquote conventional, as if he thinks maybe they're significantly wrong. Maybe he is even less competent than I thought. And you see that at a particular point in the history of life, boom, you have these new, these new forms of animal life that arise very suddenly. Yeah, and this picture Stevie Boy here made himself to specifically drive home the point he's trying to make. But what if, you know, we looked at the fact that these phyla appear over the course of more than 50 million years, and that they have animals that came before them in the Ediacaran, and we have chemical evidence of animals going all the way back to some 800 million years ago. But that might make his point less forceful. So he presents a misleading and cherry-picked image to his audience. And as I mentioned, this contradicts the Darwinian picture of the history of life. This was 
Part of his theory was the idea of universal common ancestry. It doesn't, though. Taphonomic bias doesn't contradict evolution. At most, it prevents us from having as full a picture as we might like. And he depicted that idea with a branching tree where the, the, the forms at the bottom of the tree represented the first very simple, probably one-celled organisms. The branches at the top represented all the complex forms of plants and animals we see today. And then the intermediate, the, the connecting branches represented what are called transitional intermediates or ancestral precursor forms. Now, the, the challenge of the Cambrian is represented by this part of the branching tree, which shows the first animals arising. Nope, there is almost as much time between the first animals and the Cambrian as there is between the Cambrian and now. The Cambrian is more or less halfway through the evolution of animals. They're represented by the, the, the gold dots at the top, but the blue dots represent the expected precursors that the geologists and paleontologists and evolutionary biologists attempted, or is rather expected to see in the lower strata. And in many cases they do. Look here at some probable Precambrian transitional forms. Spurgina, Kimbrella, Wawaxia, and Namacalophus, just to name a few. Do we know for a fact that all of these are in fact transitional members of stem groups leading to modern crown groups? No, we do not. But Precambrian paleontology is still a young field, and a very difficult one at that. But to pretend that we have no candidates for the ancestral forms of Cambrian organisms is simply inaccurate. And you can see the problem is that these discernible, these ancestors, these discernible ancestors have just not turned up. The blue dots represent things that should be there and aren't there. The gold dots represent what's actually there. And so what we see in the history of life is something that looks more like a lawn or perhaps an orchard of separate trees, not one big branching tree that connects up at the base with that first primordial form of life. Even if that were true, a known fossil transitional form is not required to conclude common ancestry. In fact, the fossil record is mostly superfluous to evolutionary biology. It's the icing on the cake. The layers are made of the morphology of organisms, the patterns of homology and analogy, the nested patterns of genetics and extant life, biogeography, and observed evolution. We don't need a specific organism that looks like the common ancestor of a velvet worm and a horsehair worm to reasonably conclude that such an organism existed. Just like we don't actually need the body of your ancestor to use a DNA test to show that someone is probably your fifth cousin twice removed. The DNA and shared morphology is more than enough to conclude that you two share at least one common ancestor a few generations back. Okay. And so there's a contrast, a tension, between the theory and the data. The theory and the evidence. Okay? No, there isn't. That's the challenge. That's the, that's the, and that was the problem the doubt that Darwin had, not about whether his theory was true. He was pretty convinced he'd gotten it right. But he, he had a doubt about whether his theory could explain all the relevant evidence, and he was worried about it. That's not even the point of Darwin's section on the relative paucity of the fossil record. It wasn't that he couldn't explain the evidence. He knew he could, and he could quite well, better than all competing ideas at the time. The section was about the fact that not all the evidence that would have made his conjectures even stronger existed. And so some naysayers would shove their reasons for rejecting natural and sexual selection into the box of so far unrecovered evidence. And he admitted that at the time he was around, there was probably a lot of that unrecovered evidence. And there was the possibility that he might not be able to explain it if it were uncovered, even though he could well explain all the evidence he did have. Basically, Myers confusing having no data with having data of non-existence. And this was, so this, this, this problem, this tension between the data and the theory, and the absence of those ancestral precursor forms. Oh, like these ones? Oh, <laughs>
Right. Go on. Leading up to the first complex animals, I call the mystery of the missing fossils. And this is, uh, it, the first third of my book is devoted to discussing this mystery. The mystery of why mostly microscopically small soft body organisms are hard to find in the fossil record. Gee, what a conundrum. If only taphonomy could help. Oh wait, it can. It tells us that soft tissue is less likely to fossilize, that small things are less likely to fossilize, and that as we go deeper into time, less of the sedimentary rock that formed then will be available to study today. So we get fewer fossils overall. Also, let's consider a phylum that we don't see emerging in the Cambrian. Rotifera is a phylum of tiny microscopic organisms with only one hard part, a jaw-like structure. The earliest fossils we find of them are from the Eocene. Note, these are spiralians, like snails, annelids, and brachiopods. But they branch away from those before any of them diverged, so according to the scientific consensus, they originate in the Precambrian. So why don't we find any fossils for them for the entirety of the record of life? Is it because they just don't exist and this lack of fossil evidence for rotifers is a serious problem for evolution, since they must have just appeared in the Eocene? Or maybe, just maybe, they have been around that whole time, but being microscopic and primarily soft-bodied, we probably just won't see them? I think my audience can figure out the likely answer. Uh, and here's what Darwin said about it. He said, to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods, prior to the Cambrian system, the Cambrian uh, strata, I can give no satisfactory answer. This is right in the origin of species. Now, it's really interesting. I really appreciate Darwin because uh, unlike many of his modern defenders... First, it's been more than a century and a half. We've learned a thing or two. Second, who are his modern defenders? Personally, I don't particularly care what Darwin wrote. He's irrelevant to science. His importance is in the history of science. All of his writings could be erased, all references to him deleted, and all memories of learning of him gone. And evolutionary biology wouldn't change one bit. Science is not a religion, with a prophet or guru to whom everyone is expected to show deference and believe without question. Darwin was wrong about a lot of stuff, right about some important stuff, and he was a catalyst for scientific advancement. But he wasn't a saint, he wasn't infallible, and what he says currently carries no more weight than the evidence allows it. He was, um, he was rhetorically honest. He was rhetorically modest. He didn't try to say he'd solved all the problems when he hadn't. He didn't pound his fist and say anyone who disagreed with him was, was uh, stupid or uh, ignorant or insane. Funny, because one, anti-evolutionists usually see that as a sign of weakness. They like their scientific pronouncements full of unwarranted certainty. And two, at the time of Darwin, again, more than a century and a half ago, it was possible to be a well-informed, sane, honest anti-evolutionist. The 16 or so decades in the intervening time have removed that possibility. I'll leave out sanity for now, as it's ill-defined, and just repeat that for the three honest, well-informed, and creationist, one can only be two at most. Um, but some of his modern proponents do say things like that. Uh, a few years ago, I had the chance to testify before the Texas State Board of Education and uh, they were uh, uh, looking at uh, enacting a policy provision that would encourage teachers to teach the strengths and the weaknesses of competing scientific theories. Cool, but currently there really are no competing theories in science. There are competing hypotheses within theories, some of which may eventually become theories when they withstand all tests and become the last man standing. Even things like string theory are really at best hypotheses, not theories. And in that particular case, since it has yet to my knowledge, to make even a testable prediction? It's not even a hypothesis. But of course, we all know what the bill was really about. It was about singling out those aspects of science which some people, for religious reasons, are uncomfortable about, and to lie about how good the data are for them, and to pretend that there is evidence for the truth of religious ideas for which there is no scientific evidence. You're not fooling anyone with this any more than doing a fine word and replace for creationists turning into design proponents fooled the courts into thinking of pandas and people wasn't the creationist propaganda that it was. Let's be clear about this, because I've been accused of pulling punches. And I say this fully acknowledging that some of my friends are creationists, and this disagreement does not make me love them any less. But denying evolution is on the same level as being a flat earther. There is no good reason to be either. They are both essentially impossible, and neither can be demonstrated using evidence that is both real and indicative of that possibility over others. Intelligent design and the creationism that it was invented to obfuscate aren't science. They are deceptions intended to keep money rolling in and a certain sect of Christians loyal to the sect. They are not required by Christianity, nor are they even remotely possible in science. 
And uh, one, uh, the, the Darwin-only science lobby turned out in force to argue against this seemingly common sense provision. Yeah, because like I said, we all know that your framing of this is disingenuous. No one was going to talk about the weaknesses of the globe earth theory and the strengths of flat earth. No one was going to talk about the weaknesses of electromagnetism and the strengths of believing in Thor. No one was going to talk about the weaknesses of universal gravitation and the strengths of celestial spheres propelled by angels. We all know that the only theory you care about is evolution, which is no less rigorous than those I just mentioned. Really, this here is what upsets me. Meyer is probably not an idiot. I mean, he did manage to get a PhD. He can clearly apply his mind when he wants to. So I have to conclude that he knows this bill wasn't simply a neutral bill all about science. Instead, he knows that it was dishonestly couched that way in an attempt to avoid judicial review. This is reprehensible. Honestly, I'm okay with people advocating for their beliefs being given a place at the table in various institutions, even stupid ideas. What I'm not okay with is them attempting to sneak them in duplicitously. Either own your ideas and advocate for them openly, or just get out of here. And their argument was, uh, and I quote, there are no weaknesses in the theory of evolution. If by weaknesses we mean unexplained phenomena which are significant enough to bring major components of the theory into question, then that's true. There are none. Now, if we just mean things currently not well understood, well, then of course there are, as is the case in all theories. And just because there are aspects of electromagnetism that are not well understood in modern physics doesn't mean we get to invoke Thor, the god of thunder, as our new explanatory mechanism. Let me get it up there. There we go. And uh, this is Eugenie Scott, who was then the, the uh, president of the National Center for Science Education, a small Darwin-only science lobbying group out of Oakland, California. You gotta love how much he poisons the well. Their size doesn't matter. They are not Darwin only. In fact, they advocate for a lot of things that have nothing to do with Darwin, like genetic drift, or heck, genetics as we know it. They are only science should be in science classroom proponents. And what do they think should count as science? Well, the consensus of scientists in any given field, and there is no dissent from evolutionary biology that has any actual evidentiary merit, so ideas dissenting from it are not science. And when I saw this, I, I thought this was, a, a, you know, a, a, an incredibly unfortunate statement. I was about to pre present into evidence 100 peer-reviewed, a binder of 100 peer-reviewed scientific arg articles questioning various aspects of contemporary evolutionary theory, what's known as neo-Darwinism, the standard textbook theory that we all learn in, the, in our high school and college biology texts. So, oh, congratulations, Steve. You found 100 papers about open questions in evolutionary biology. I'm sure you were shocked to discover that evolutionary biology is a field of active research in which scholars are still raising questions and disagreeing about the answers. I'm not sure what he would expect. A moribund field where no progress has been made in decades? I think we'll find that more accurately describes creationism, zetetic astronomy, astrology, and phrenology. And hey, you know what those all have in common? None of them take the data seriously and instead have predetermined conclusions which they must ram the data into. And no, I'm not going to stop equating intelligent design with creationism because when you look at documents like the Wedge document or the court case around of pandas and people, it is clear that all it is is Christian creationism trying to pull a blanket of agnosticism over its head in hopes that it will be an adequate disguise. At the very least, there are scientific problems with the theory, scientific weaknesses of the theory that need to be explored. Darwin was aware of some in his time and talked about them openly, but unfortunately in our modern discussion of, of biological origins, too many people defending the orthodox view think that it's, uh, they, they can't acknowledge the actual state of the science that is, is in play. I would love for him to give us an example of such weaknesses instead of simply complaining that people say they don't exist. This is exactly the same tactic as a flat earther saying that they'll believe in the globe if shown evidence, then being shown evidence and simply declaring that it doesn't count for some reason they've made up on the spot. Because the real answer is that what would convince them is nothing. But they know being open about that makes them look bad, so they pretend that the supposed lack of evidence is a problem for the globe, even though there is no lack of evidence. Um, one of the worst offenders in this regard is the well-known uh, evolutionary biologist and new atheist named Richard Dawkins from um, Oxford University. He's actually said if, it's absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane. And then he said, in parentheses, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. And I thought that was really sporting of him not to consider that maybe the people who disagreed with him were wicked. Um, it is sporting of him, because many of them are demonstrably wicked liars. We know for a fact that people like Andrew Snelling, Kent Hovind, and Meyer himself are deeply dishonest. 
It's not often that I would defend Richard Dawkins or care much about what he says at all, and it's even more rare that I would say that he inappropriately held back in his criticism. But here he certainly did. Many professionals and even some amateur creationists are demonstrably liars, bigots, fraudsters, and genocidal maniacs. Not all of them are, but the ones who are are certainly motivated to be so by the same basic beliefs that motivate their anti-evolution stances in the first place. That's not rhetorical modesty. That's rhetorical excess. And there's an awful lot of it in this debate. And I'm going to have to disagree. I think it is inappropriately restrained. So I do appreciate that Darwin was uh, so honest about the things that he could and the things that he couldn't explain. So his uh, statement here, the case, the, Cambrian ex the evidence from the Cambrian explosion, at present must remain inexplicable and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. So that's the, what I call the mystery of the missing fossils. And it, it haunted Darwin to his death, but he did have, um, he was a smart guy, and he had an idea about how this could be resolved. He thought that, um, let's see, I'm coordinating my forces here. Okay, mystery of the missing fossils, ta-da. He thought that the absence of these ancestral intermediate forms could be, ex would be eventually explained away by future fossil discoveries, which is to say that the missing forms would actually turn up. Well, cool that we already found some then, isn't it? If we kept looking hard enough in the, in the pre-Cambrian strata around the world. So he, he had this charming analogy to a book that the, that the uh, fossil record was like a, um, he, said, uh, he said, I look at the natural geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept. Seems like it is, given that we can be pretty sure that rotifers didn't just pop into existence in the Eocene which would violate even Meyer's idea of phylum coming de novo out of the Cambrian. And on this view, the difficulties discussed above about the Cambrian explosion are greatly diminished. So he said, imagine that the fossil record is kind of like a book, and it's, it's recording some of, the chap some of the layers are there. They're like a chapter. But then other chapters here and there are missing. And some chapters, we may only have one page. And, and uh, eventually, if we find the other pages and the other chapters, then, we'll sh then it will show this seamless, gradual, continuous, changing progression described by his history of life depiction of the origin of all the new forms of life on Earth. Well, that's overly optimistic in my opinion. There is no reason to think all species have left fossils, and that all species who did still have fossils extant, as opposed to being weathered away or subducted into the mantle. We only find that subset of organisms that one, were fossilized, two, whose fossils survive until today, and three, who are still in strata exposed and accessible to humans. That is of necessity only a small fraction of the organisms ever to have existed. So expecting such a record to be seamless and complete is, to put it mildly, supremely optimistic. So that was, what, that was his hope. Uh, and this idea became known later as the artifact hypothesis. Uh, and it, the idea there is that the absence of those fossils in the lower pre-Cambrian layers, which is now a relatively lower abundance of fossils, not a lack, let's remember, are an artifact or a byproduct of our incomplete sampling of the fossil record. We just haven't looked hard enough. And another version of that same idea, well, a slightly different version, but the same kind of concept, was that the, the, the missing ancestors are an artifact of incomplete preservation. Maybe there was something in those lower, in the sedimentary, uh, uh, the sediments th uh, that were in the Precambrian that were just not capable of preserving. Like rotifers. Hey, we already showed this hypothesis to be viable. Neat how some basic knowledge of zoology and taphonomy can do that. Those ancestors. Maybe they were too small. Maybe they were too soft to have been fossilized. He just keeps describing rotifers, and I kind of love it. So that was another idea. That said, it was, so either it was an artifact of incomplete sampling, inadequate sampling, or incomplete preservation. And that idea became kind of the go-to explanation as to why these fossils were missing. So here I really hope he's going to tell us why he thinks that there is no taphonomic bias in which organisms are preserved, and why we have reason to think that we have a nearly complete sampling of all paleoenvironments from all places at all times. Otherwise, he hasn't really changed this idea. And of course, I'll keep saying it, they're not all missing. Now, unfortunately, for the defenders of Darwin's theory, uh, additional fossil finds have not actually resolved the mystery of the missing fossils. It's not at all mysterious, really. They've actually made the mystery more acute. In Darwin's time, there were um, a lot of, um, there were a couple main forms of, several main forms 
of animals that were known. There were these trilobites, which fascinated me as a kid. They look kind of like potato bugs, if you've watched those guys. But uh, it's, uh, they, uh, oh, oh, I forgot, I have a really nice sample of one that has a compound, you can see the structure of the compound eye in the, in the fossil that I have. And it, it's just, you, you realize that it was a very sophisticated visual apparatus from, from the very, present from the very beginning, from the dawn of animal life. It's extraordinary how complex these animals were. From the dawn of animal life, huh? Well, the first trilobites appear in the fossil record about 521 million years ago. Weird how in 2021, the body fossil of an 890 million year old sponge was found. I wonder, does 369 million years from the earliest animal fossil count as the dawn of animals? Just to put that into perspective, there was about as much time between the first known animal fossil and the first trilobite as there is between the first fish to crawl on land and you. We're talking about the Femenian stage of the late Devonian. Amniotes hadn't evolved. Land was still almost exclusively the domain of non-vascular plants and arthropods. Sharks were still the new kids on the block. Somehow, I think 369 million years is enough time to figure out an eyeball or two. But, and Darwin knew about these guys. He also knew about other, other uh, um, <clears throat> animals called brachiopods and, and several others. There were several main groups. But in 1909, there was, a ma there was a huge fossil find. Do I have a picture of Canada behind me? Okay, thank you. Uh, um, I didn't want to keep turning around. Uh, how, how interesting can the back of my head be, right? And uh, <clears throat> it, it, right near the border between uh, uh, British Columbia and Alberta, in a place near Field, BC. And these fossils were discovered by a paleontologist named uh, Charles Walcott. At this point, Myra goes on an aside about the conditions of Walcott's prospecting. I can't see how that's relevant, so I'm cutting it out. And as they pulled the horse out, he flipped one over, and it revealed an amazing, uh, delicate lace crab. That's Morella splendens, which isn't a crab at all, by the way. It's not even a crustacean. It's probably a stem mandibulate. But even that is unclear, given how basal much of its anatomy is. An animal that had been previously unknown, and unknown to this period of time, and you can imagine the winter that Walcott had waiting to go back to see what other treasures lay in these hunks of, of shale, later, which later became known as the Burgess Shale. Primarily more of the same, as M. splendens is the most common fossil, but there are lots of other neat stuff too. And he did in fact go back, and the Burgess Shale, this is an artist's depiction of, the, uh, of, of, that, of that lace crab, I want to point out, because Meyer hasn't, but lace crab is not referring to any modern group of animals. These are animals that went extinct long before any crustaceans evolved a crab-like form, and it didn't even have one itself. Lace crab was just an informal term Walcott used. It has no scientific significance, and even though Meyer is using it like it's a common name of some living animal group, it is not. And he went back, and it was a trove of new animal forms. Uh, here's another guy called Waptia. Waptia is a genus of so-called bivalved arthropod. It's not quite a crustacean, although we're getting closer, and it is almost certainly in crown mandibulato. Uh, it, you see the beautifully segmented, uh, articulated exoskeleton there. It looks like a, like a shrimp with a hard head shield. Um, here's a, 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 a picture of another fossil of this guy from another locale with a beautiful artist's rendition. But you can, you can see that, um, well, there were just all kinds of interesting... Is this guy, oh, good. This guy's called an opabinia. Opabinia is in fact a stem arthropod. That means it's technically outside the phylum Arthropoda, just like velvet worms. But this puts the lie to the idea of phyla representing body plants with no higher nesting or transitions. Opabinia is clearly closely related to the arthropods, yet it would be in a different phylum in today's classification system. That is because at the opening of the Cambrian, the time since the various phyla diverged was similar to the time between today's classes or orders. That is, Opabinia is as related to Morella as you are to a bird yet they would end up in different phyla. As we go back in time, all life at that time is more related to each other than their descendants are to each other because, you know, there are lower diversions times involved. Basically, as we go through time, evolution occurs at what we see, on the whole, as lower and lower ranks. Not because anything new is happening, but simply because the tree can only branch as it goes forward, so of necessity, new evolution appears at lower ranks. If you were to study the Cambrian back in time in real time without knowledge of the future history of life, you'd probably put Opabinia and Morella in the same phylum, possibly even the same class, maybe something like Segmenta or something like that. He has five eyes, a long proboscis, and, a, and I think it's about 30 segmented body segments. 
Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, the famous Harvard paleontologist, wrote a book called Wonderful Life, all about these extraordinary animals that were discovered in the Burgess Shale. So whereas before, we had a few basic forms of animal life that we knew had arisen or that the paleontologists in Darwin's time knew had arisen in a, in a really discreet and abrupt way. Now, as, as a result of the Burgess Shale, there was, and I'm showing a bunch of, this is this guy, this is guy called Wewaxia. Probably a stem mollusk, which again puts the lie to Meyer's claim about the distinctness of the phyla. As a stem mollusk, it's outside the phyla mollusca. Yet it clearly has a similar body plan with a dorsal shell over a mantle and presumably a ventral foot-like organ. Yet it's not quite a mollusk. It's almost like Meyer's own examples show that his main talking points are nonsense. All these are animals. This guy kind of scooted around the bottom. Um, now as the results of the Burgess Shale discoveries, there are loads more animal forms whose first appearance is documented in the Cambrian period. And who demonstrate the evolution of phyla from within even higher categories, most of which are unranked. Because again, the ranks are arbitrary, and saying that phyla is where it's at is really just as silly as when Ken Ham picks families for where he thinks common ancestry stops. Both are simply arbitrary stopping points chosen because going any higher makes the creationist in question uncomfortable. And each of whom lack ancestral precursors in the lower Precambrian strata. Some do, some don't, which is what we expected. Unless, of course, Meyer is going to argue for the complete perfection of the fossil record. I now wonder if he'll even try. So now, from our vantage point, we've discovered that the Cambrian explosion was much more explosive than it was understood to be in Darwin's time. No, it's just the first radiation of hard-body animals, that's all. And it also took tens of millions of years, and it was preceded by hundreds of millions of years of animal evolution. The first radiation of hard-bodied animals had to happen sometime, and that was always going to look like a sudden burst onto the scene of lots of animal life, simply because of taphonomic bias for hard mineralized parts. The mystery of the missing fossils wasn't attenuated or mitigated by fossil finds, it was accentuated, it was made more acute. Except it wasn't, as I just described. We found clear evidence of things that were closely related to crown members of modern phyla, but weren't quite them, which is exactly what you'd expect to see if common ancestry goes back further than the phylum level. Oh, okay, now this is the next big fossil find. 1984 in southern China, there's another huge Cambrian discovery. And it was very exciting. It, uh, in, by, in the 1990s, they ended up doing a cover story on it in Time magazine with the title, Evolution's Big Bang. I'm honestly not a huge fan of that title, but whatever. And one of the paleontologists who, who was uh, commenting on this find, uh, it, it was extraordinary for a number of reasons. The preservation was even more exquisite than the fossils at, at the Burgess Shale. There were more new animals discovered than, than had been known even from the Burgess find. So the explosion again looked more explosive, more new forms of animal life, again, each lacking those ancestral intermediates. Well, we haven't been told what any of them are, so I can't say if that's true or not. It'd be nice if instead of paraphrasing what some unnamed contributor to a National Geographic article said, we were told what was actually found and perhaps some citations so we could look things up about said organisms. And the time period in which uh, geologists uh, estimated these events to have occurred shrunk quite dramatically. And so... Um, I don't really care to check on that. If true, it still shrank a period of time still best measured in tens of millions of years. That's not exactly overnight even for evolution. One of the paleontologists quoted in this article said, well, what I like to ask my evolutionary biologist friends is this, how much faster does this event have to get before we stop calling it evolution? You have to show that it couldn't happen that fast. Now, I don't know off the top of my head how fast that would be because I don't know enough about the organisms involved to talk coherently about things like generation time and expected rate of morphological change, but I'm going to say that it's gonna have to be shorter than, you know, the almost 400 million years since the earliest known animals to count as a time too short for evolution. Maybe under a million years would do it. Maybe that's too extreme. It's a weird question to ask given that so far nothing here has hinted at a lack of evolution. And in fact, the predictions of evolution have been borne out instead. It's really abrupt, okay? So this was, this accentuated the mystery. And uh, in, in the year 2000, we had a, uh, Oh, okay, we're just going to say that 1984 was a mysterious year for scientists, and that all that happened was they found some unnamed Cambrian life, and that some guy talked about it in Nat Geo. Then we're going to talk about something 16 years later. Sure, why not? It's not like the actual finds in 1984 were important to this topic or something. 
is a lot of ramble about how that scientist went to Washington and showed off some fossils. It's boring and irrelevant, so I'm cutting it out. And we're also going to end episode one at this point. So thank you very much, guys, for sticking with me for this long. Stephen Meyer is a pain in the butt to listen to, but hey, you know what? I respond to him so that he's easier for you to listen to and realize why what he says is dumb. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me in the comments what you didn't like. Either way, I do hope you comment. And also make sure that you're subscribed to the channel if you're not already. And hit the bell icon and turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Work in Progress, Ben Tovend, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, John Ackerman, Chris Love, Landon Noel, Yepetus, Mabity Babity, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching. Thank you.